Hi everyone, uh, my name's Larry. Uh, I'm an artist, travelled up from London today where I was uh, born and raised. Um, in terms of my art practice, I, I work across the board. So I do a range of things. I make video works, performances, I work with sound, uh, objects. Um, so that might be a painting or a sculpture. Um, essentially, I kind of get bored just doing the same thing all the time. So I, I vary things quite a lot. And also I find working with different art forms for me um, allows me to have different kinds of conversations. So I guess with what I'll be showing you, uh, hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea as to you know, the, uh, the way that I work. Um, what's also important to my practice as well is that uh, I work both within a, a solo and a co collaborative uh, context. So um, over the last five years, for example, I've been working with an artist called David Blandy. And we've been um, creating a range of projects. Uh, very recently, we were nominated for a pretty decent award called the, uh, the Jarman Award, which we'll find out if we got in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I'll also be talking about some of my solo projects as well. I guess one of the things to note is that even when I talk about my projects, projects as solo projects, um, that's really uh, projects that I'm kind of directing myself. It doesn't mean that it doesn't kind of involve other people, which for me is a very important thing. I think um, working with people, especially when you raise the ambition of what you're doing, is, is, is very important because uh, you know, I mean, basic things like if you're shooting a film and you have two cameras, you know, it's kind of helpful to have someone else who's operating the other camera so you don't have to focus on that. And, you know, you can be roving with the, uh, the other camera. So, um, yeah, let's get things started. Uh, I, thought I'd, I thought I'd kind of begin by talking about um, one of the, uh, the, the most early projects that I did uh, after I finished my, uh, my studies, my masters in uh, sculpture at the Slade School of Art in, in London. Um, this project titled Memuja, which um, means my blood in tree, which is a Ghanaian language. I, I originate from Ghana, by the way. Um, essentially is something of a self-portrait kind of project. I, I wanted to create a project that was something of a self-portrait, but that um, allowed me to trace the, uh, the, the heritage of, of high life music. Uh, does anybody know what high life music is, by the way? Nah, it always happens. All right, um, Afrobeat. Has anybody heard of Fela Kuti? Yeah. All right, cool. So Fela Kuti, he was an Afrobeat artist uh, or musician. And uh, high life um, is kind of a precursor to, to Afrobeat. Um, Afrobeat is created by um, taking elements of high life music and uh, combining them with jazz. Um, in a nutshell, I'd, I would say high life music is it's like the sound of the sun. And in that respect, I'd say it's like the antithesis of the blues. It's very upbeat, um, loads of ryth rhythms that are syncopated with uh, bands, you know, uh, starting with as small as 10 people and as big as 20 people. Everybody has their little part to play. And once everything is joined together, you just have this incredible, what I refer to as the sound of the sun. And I kind of talk about it that way um, because of the way that my, my parents used to play uh, High Life Records when I was a kid. Um, so when I was really young, um, my mum would play these records that my mum and dad had brought over from Ghana of the other uh, few possessions they brought over. They, they happened to bring these records. And I'd notice whenever my mum was playing these records, she, she would, she'd be so happy, really like joyous. Um, just, it's like you could feel that love. Um, for me personally as a kid, I don't really like the sounds to begin with. I found the, uh, the high uh, pitches and octaves are a bit annoying. Um, but after a while, somehow it kind of made its way into my, my body of sorts. And I think one memory, another memory that I have with, uh, in terms of these sounds being played as a kid is for some reason, I, I kind of um, equate playing records or hearing the, the crackles and the pops with uh, the sound of food frying or cooking for some reason. I imagine it, it could be because when my mom was playing some of this music, she might have been like cleaning up or, um, or, or cooking a meal for us, that kind of thing. So there's, there's something for me that is very um, nostalgic about, about these, these particular sounds that I wanted to research. Uh, high life music also has quite a strong 
uh, social um, uh, kind of part to play in terms of uh, Ghana's uh, freedom from uh, colonialism from uh, the, the British. So uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who was Ghana's first uh, president, whenever he would travel either uh, nationally or internationally, he would take um, a, a, a high life band with him, um, which was lead, led by one of the, uh, the big uh, high life um, musicians of the time, E.T. Mensa. Uh, for him, it was very important to uh, express this, this art form, uh, not, not simply just on a political level, but also on a social basis. So to uh, kind of, I guess, bring out some of the, uh, the fruits of uh, Ghana's heritage, as it were. This image is also of a, a follow-up uh, to the, uh, the, the Memuja project titled Mormuja, which uh, was kind of more of a collaboration with a, uh, an archive based in, in Accra, in Ghana's capital. So I worked alongside a, uh, this amazing researcher by the name of John Collins, a British-German guy who's been based in Ghana since the other 60s. And, um, and, and he has a really amazing archive in, in Accra called the uh, uh, BATMAF archive, or the Boko African Popular Archives Music Foundation. Yes. Yeah, no, it's that, yeah. Sorry, it's such a long uh, kind of sentence. I should probably cut it down. But... Um, so I got in touch with uh, John Collins through, um, actually through the first project. So when I was kind of tracing through these records that um, my mum used to play, I, I tried to find some of the, uh, the, the musicians. So I, you know, go and Google, try and do the research. A lot of the musicians were dead, um, but I realized that uh, John ha happened to still be alive. So I, I contacted him and was just saying, oh, look, you know, like I'm trying to make this project. It's, it's an art project, but it's also, it's, it's very musical. It's like a beat tape. I'm kind of, I'm taking my influences of having like grown up in East London and, and, and been around people who produced, you know, garage music, grime, or what would be called grime, you know, hip hop uh, artists like Jay Diller, Madlib. I, I want to create this thing. I want to chop up and sample high life music can do this incredible thing. Really, really, you know, long email. He just responded and said, great, good luck. And um, for me, that was, that was enough kind of impetus to just, you know, go and do it. But once I did the, uh, the project, I kind of, I wanted to continue the, uh, the conversation with him. And, uh, and so John allowed me to use some of his own uh, personal archive uh, to, to create um, the, uh, the, the More Mudra project, which I'd say tonally, is it has much more of an acoustic sound in comparison to the, uh, the, the Memojo project. Anyway, I thought at this point I'd play um, a couple of samples for you. One sample of a, uh, a track that I, that I used in the, uh, the Memojo project from a, uh, a band called uh, the African Brothers International Band. And then after that, I'll play what it is that I did with that using the, uh, the, the types of technology that, I, that was uh, available to me. And this is what I did with that same, that, that, that set of sounds using um, uh, an MPC or music production center. I should probably say, um, for those of you that don't know what a music production center is, it's a, um, it's, well, it's kind of now quite dated, but uh, it's, a, it's a sequencer and machine that initially was created by a guy called Roger Lynn. The reason why he created it in the, uh, the 70s and 80s was uh, for producers to be able to write music uh, without the need of a, uh, a session drummer. So essentially it was supposed to be like a drum, drum machine. But what's amazing about this piece of technology is that it has, a, uh, um, it has sampling technology. 
So you have a certain amount of time from which you can sample within the other machine. So I essentially use that to uh, create beats, having taken inspiration from the likes, again, like I said, you know, Jay Diller, Pete Rock, Mad Lib, uh, even the likes of Kanye West, who, who uses an MPC. <laughs> So um, before moving on, another thing to note, you know, with this project, um, the idea was that it wouldn't exist as a, as a typical artwork within a gallery space. Um, I wanted to create a record that you could actually purchase in, 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 a, sh in a store. So, um, so I did go about that whole process of uh, talking to a record presser's kind of company, getting them to, you know, produce the record based on my direction and, and so on. Um, and then I wanted to have, uh, I guess, a internet-based component of that. By that, I mean a download. So uh, the work actually exists for you to download. You can you know, pay your own price, you find it on Bandcamp, uh, or you don't even have to pay anything. The reason why I did that was, uh, for me personally, coming from a working class background, I know a lot of people who just won't go to galleries. They won't go to gallery shows. But I think there's still ways of being able to get art outside, you know, um, it just doesn't have to be a, a gallery space, which for me sometimes can be an issue. You know, there's, there's uh, I think there are co connotations with uh, exclusivity in terms of uh, a gallery based environment, you know, and, 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 and people of certain classes or certain race or culture, they don't feel welcome within that. And, and, and rightly so in, in, in some ways. Um, so the idea was really to, to create something that could exist anywhere. You know, it's not simply just about it's standing on a plinth and then oh, yeah, you can see it, but you know, you can, you can pop it on your iPod or your, you know, your Android phone or whatever, you know? Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, like I said, the practice is, is very varied. Um, I have a very strong kind of uh, visual uh, component to, to what I do. Uh, on the, uh, the far right of this uh, slide, you will notice an artwork that I created just over 10 years ago called Let Me School You. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, I decided to show some images that um, kind of connect to how uh, I was stimulated to create the, uh, the Let Me School You work and what kind of followed in terms of these pieces here, the, uh, the Glyph series. Um, I won't really talk too much about the, uh, the, the middle two inspirations. I think, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're quite almost self self-explanatory, or at least yeah, the Frank Sidebottom one will be when I talk about um, uh, another piece that connects to the other uh, Let Me School You work. But um, have any of you guys had uh, Robertson's Golden Shred Marmalade before? Yeah. yeah, some of you. Do you know of the other uh, Robertson's Golly? Some of you. All right, so um, I guess to add a bit of history and also where my own kind of history connects to this, uh, as a kid, my mum used to prepare, uh, you know, breakfast and um, sometimes on the breakfast table I would see uh, this Robertson's marmalade jam. And on the side of the, uh, uh, the, the jam uh, bottles, I'd notice this, uh, this really weird token um, of this Robertson's golly character. I'd ask my mum, you know, what is it? She couldn't explain what it was to me. You know, she came from Ghana, so my dad. That type of imagery doesn't really exist in the likes of Kamasi or even Accra. So um, for me, I, I, I felt quite, quite upset about it. It just it, it didn't make sense to me. It's this really kind of weird, uh, derogatory kind of looking character. 
and um, it seems to be poking fun of, 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 of black people. Um, so kind of jumping back to this moment in time where I was, um, this is later on, years later on, where I began to scan uh, family photo albums. That, that's me, by the way, in this image. Um, I was thinking a lot about uh, visibility or invisibility of people of color. Um, so I decided to, I guess, do a little bit of research about the other Robertson's uh, Gollywog character and how, how it kind of came into uh, fruition. And the, uh, the CEO of the other Robertson's brand, um, going all the way back to pre-World War I times, so this is like close to over 100 years ago, I guess, um, the, the CEO traveled to the United States. They, they went to and became very inspired by uh, the American minstrel shows. Does anybody here know what minstrel shows are? How many people? All right, not, not many, all right. The older folk, not the younger folk, which is understandable. Um, so, uh, minstrel shows are, uh, are, are productions um, that uh, stereotype and, and present uh, derogatory uh, representations of black people. So, um, you'll have uh, white men or women who kind of blacken up their faces and then they have like, you know, red lips kind of painted around them. You might have seen images or memes or that kind of thing in relation to those, those kinds of images. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the CEO of, of Robertson's was so inspired by these uh, derogatory kind of uh, productions showing uh, stereotypes of black people as being uh, sexually potent or um, wanting to eat um, fried chicken or watermelon all the time. And in coming back to the UK, thought, oh, well, we need to create a, a, a mascot. And out of that pops the, uh, the Robertson's Golly. So the, the Robertson's Golly was represented through, you know, illustrations and cartoons, um, theatrical productions, music, uh, dolls, the world over. I, I mean, and, and this also isn't just the thing that inspired the, uh, the Robertson's brand in the UK, you know, in the, uh, in the Netherlands, you have uh, Black Pete. In, um, in Spain, you have a, uh, a product, I think it's like a, a type of sweet or chocolate called uh, Los Conguitos, which still exists. So this, this kind of really made um, kind of big like head waves across the, uh, the, the, the West. And um, essentially is racism normalized. It's normalized because it becomes accepted within society. One thing that um, I can tell you is when I show some of this work, usually if I'm talking to um, a, a white man or woman of a certain age, much older, they'll explain and say to me, well, you know, when I was younger, this was the norm. This wasn't really seen as something to kind of laugh about. It was just the thing that you had. But, um, but again, that's an example of how racism becomes normalized. Or if you kind of compare that to the way in which uh, sexism uh, was normalized within you know the workplace or in public or so on so i'm sure you kind of get what it is that i'm kind of um po pointing at here um i should also mention that the uh, the, the robertson's brand they discontinued the uh, the, the golly world character in 2002 2003 and the only reason why they did discontinue this was to move with the times as they said and it was not to kind of respond to political correctness so, so from that, you can see their, their plans were really business-based decisions. It wasn't really thinking about people, it was really thinking about capital, thinking about money. So like I said, the, uh, the Glyph series kind of follows. It's an ongoing series. And, um, and at the moment, I've, made, I've really just used uh, family photo albums. So everyone within these, these images I know. It's my mum on the, uh, the, the, the far right, my mum again on the far left. This handsome chap is me at the bottom middle. Um, my mum is up here with my uncle and my auntie. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the middle left, you have uh, my brother on the far left with some other uh, relatives. My aunt is kind of like the top middle holding my, uh, my baby uh, cousin. <clears throat> so, um, this, you know, the, the, the work was kind of uh, brought in, you know, IRL or, you know, in real life uh, into a kind of performance in, in 2013, uh, following a, uh, a project that I'd worked on with, uh, with the, the tape. 
I, and, and I'd been invited along with other artists across uh, an academic year of 2012 through 2013 to work with uh, young people from uh, schools and colleges uh, all around the, uh, the UK. And uh, by working with them, we were allowed to utilize the, uh, the Tate's archive uh, as well as some of the, uh, the public exhibitions on, on display to think about um, what art means to them and what art practice could mean uh, both within a, a kind of gallery space and then, you know, social or home kind of based environment. But coming toward the, uh, the end of uh, this, this kind of program and experience, uh, myself and the other artists, we were invited to uh, create a work kind of in response to our experience of, of working with the tape. And, um, and one thing that I noticed uh, and not simply just by going, visiting the lights of Tate, but going to the V&A or you know, other uh, spaces, as it were, exhibition spaces. One thing that I tended to notice was the, uh, the, the people who were working within you know, service positions, so you know, invigilators or uh, cleaners, people serving food and so on, they tended to be uh, people of colour. They tended to be black people or people who were working class. And, um, and that's something that's that, that, that even you know, annoys me now, and, and I wanted to create, I guess, a, something of a response to that. So I figured I'd uh, work on this, this performance title, Cloud, where I'd do something of a, of a reverse heist. And I say reverse heist because on the, uh, the far right of this image, which is part of the, uh, the, ma the main part of the, uh, um, the performance, the images on the middle and the left showcase uh, the procession. Um, I, I sit as the other cloud face within uh, an area in the level two part of Tate Modern called uh, Poetry, Poetry and Dream. And um, you might notice uh, one of the other uh, Cubist works by uh, Picasso. The reason why I wanted to sit next to uh, some work by Picasso, particularly the other uh, Cubist works, was to think about uh, the likes of him or Matisse and, and other such artists and their uh, inspiration, but also appropriation from um, artworks by communities within Western Africa. And you see within art canon, that doesn't tend to usually get spoken about. Whenever I was taught about Picasso or, um, or Matisse and so on, um, we were presented with some of the, uh, the, the greatest artists on the planet by, by gaining inspiration from uh, people that were surrounded by them, not by gaining inspiration from artifacts that you know, from another uh, part of the other world. So I wanted to think about taking that energy, harnessing that energy, and then pulling that back, which is why I refer to that as a, uh, a reverse heist. And uh, in case you are wondering, I sat in that position there for about an hour without really moving. Um, it took quite a lot to kind of train to do that. Uh, as you can imagine, and by me uh, walking with uh, this young lady by the name of Haley Joy Rose, um, the, the helmet that I created out of polystyrene and, and resins has no uh, kind of, you know, viewing point or rectangle. Uh, and also breathing is very much restricted, apart from the, uh, the hole in which, you know, which kind of my head fits through. Uh, there's nowhere else that you can breathe. So it gets very warm in there very quickly. And likelihood is if you don't know how to, you know, control your breathing, you might faint. So before doing this performance, I spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos about you know, breathing exercises and stuff like that to really kind of train to get myself ready for that. Because it really wasn't easy, it's really difficult. And you can imagine when you have the sounds of uh, voices, of people, people's voices, which then kind of bounce around this circular head, you, you, you can't tell your kind of uh, peripheral uh, hearing. Your, your sight is gone as well, so everything it's just around you, kind of like times 10 in terms of sound. It's, everything's bouncing around you. Um, so, you know, like I said earlier on, I, I work collaboratively with, um, with artists from time to time. Probably one of the most central uh, collaborations for me at the moment is with uh, a friend of mine, David Blandy, who also happened to study at the uh, Slade School of, of Fine Art. But um, he, he graduated a good few years before I did. He finished in 2003 and I finished in, in 2008. And, um, and we met each other through a, uh, a show that he happened to be uh, doing. I, I, I went along to this show that he was 
uh, showcasing, which had a, a kind of video-based performance. The work was called Biter, and he was invited to work with uh, the uh, critical thinker and theorist, the uh, Sigmund Freud, his uh, collection and his kind of final consulting space in, in, in West London. And uh, within this video work that David has called Biter, he's, he's more or less sitting within uh, Freud's consulting space, and he's trying to remember all of these hip hop lyrics from the, uh, the Wu-Tang Clan, which, is, which are his like, favorite uh, group. And um, it's quite a funny um, video and, and quite engaging as well to see this you know, middle class white guy trying to spit rhymes and do it really badly. Um, but uh, one of the things that I noticed with when he was talking about the work was his, his love of hip hop. Yet for me, I, I couldn't see the element of, um, of beats or production, audio production kind of taking place within there. So I asked a very kind of selfish question and said, well, you know, where, where's the beat maker? Where's the, you know, the, the background uh, music? And he said, well, I'm only one person. And kind of in a way from there, we, it kind of followed. We just, we had a chat outside of the, uh, the presentation that he had and, um, and I gave him my card and I'd say like a few months later, he just sent me a text and said, Hey man, you up for doing a performance in Moscow? I'm like, what? I've never traveled to Moscow before. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, the performance in Moscow didn't happen, but outside of the, uh, the beginnings of these conversations, we created a, a, a kind of a performance forward slash uh, hip hop crew called The Biters. And the idea with the, uh, the Biters project was that um, David and myself, we would assume uh, alternate identities that were constantly changing um, but with that, we would be stealing rhymes and beats, or I'd also create beats from the ground up, and we would use these in these uh, music videos that we would create, as well as performances that we did. And we actually toured these performances right across the UK. So, you know, uh, as far as, uh, you know, Exeter, uh, pushing far as, as far north as um, Newcastle. So, um, you know, we'd worked with, within bands, you know, individually before. We kind of worked within that type of process, but we'd never kind of done that within a, an, an art type uh, situation. So it was very, you know, new for us and, and exciting. But um, I think one thing that got a bit annoying for us at, at one point was uh, the way in which we were invited to uh, do these performances as if we were part of the entertainment. So people were kind of being entertained by what we were doing, but not on a kind of like intellectual level. And for us, there was certainly an intellectual kind of conversation, one about appropriation, its place within the, uh, the, the art gallery space, and what that means within the, uh, the, the 21st century. So following on from uh, the, uh, the Biotis project, we wanted to, I guess, kind of go deeper into uh, intellectual but social conversations um, in a way that didn't feel like, you know, we're simply just playing music. And, uh, and, and out of that popped the, uh, the Finding Fanon project. Uh, do any of you know uh, who Franz Fanon is? No, okay. Yeah, one, good. Um, <laughs> uh, Fran Franz Fanon is uh, referred to as one of the godfathers of, um, of the colonial theory, uh, alongside the likes of uh, M.A. Cesare. And um, he, he wrote extensively uh, around the experiences of, uh, of people of color um, and the experience of racism within uh, the Western world. So he speaks within his writings um, like uh, Black Skin, White Masks, for example, really interesting uh, book that for me kind of, um, I'd say kept me going during my, uh, my BA degree years between 2002 to 2005. Uh, he talks a lot about the experience of being persecuted um, within different Western environments, um, mentally, uh, physically, socially, and so on. Uh, there's a particular passage within the uh, Black Skin, White Masks book where uh, Fanon talks about um, an experience of, uh, of, of, of being othered, being kind of turned into an object, where a, uh, a young uh, French girl uh, is kind of like nudging her mother and saying, uh, as she sees Fanon, look, mummy, look, a Negro. And I remember reading that passage, you know, early 2000s, and thinking a lot about my experience of, um, I don't know, being on an underground 
uh, train in, in, in London and seeing white people kind of clutch their bags just a little bit tighter or looking at me in a way like they, they seem a bit afraid, like I'm this, some kind of beast, like ready to attack them or whatnot. So kind of looking at these, these, uh, these words that Fanon had written from, from previous decades, you know, five, six plus decades ago, I was just really wowed at the fact that someone from that point in time was writing about an experience that was very current and contemporary for me. Um, so I, I'd say that Fanon's work has kind of influenced a lot of my practice, but um, I, I think this particular project, the, uh, the, the Finding Fanon trilogy, uh, for David and I, we kind of go a bit deeper into uh, some of Fanon's ideas. And where Fanon fits in within the, uh, the trilogy is I found out from a, uh, a friend of mine and a really interesting artist uh, by the name of Kojo Eshran. He's part of a uh, uh, collaborative collective called the Otolith Group, uh, whom you should look up if you don't know of their, their work, by the way. Um, we were talking uh, one day. We, whenever we meet up and talk, he, he, he always kind of talks about uh, science fiction because he knows I love science fiction and, and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and, and somehow he, he, he was talking about Fanon at some point. I don't know why, but he, he kind of made it known to me that uh, Fanon had written three plays that, had, that kind of existed in manuscript form, uh, but had never really been you know, accounted for or published. And, um, and my mind just exploded at the thought of that because having read some of his writings, and, and there's, there really is a poetry to, to the way that he wrote. Um, it just got me thinking, you know, what, what might the, the, the pieces of writing sound like? Where might they, you know, exist environment wise? The, at what point in time, you know, these like science fiction works or, you know. Um, so, um, so I brought this kind of, this, uh, this, this revelation to David and was like, look, this is the project that we have to do. Um, you know, there's, there, there, there's a lot around these conversations that, that Fanon uh, kind of warns around um, this kind of great explosion um, that I think uh, is very current to uh, the, the, the situation that we have in the UK. And also, mind you, this is before the Brexit vote came in. So, you know, this is before that kind of um, situation where people separate themselves with leave and remain kind of came in. It was really... For me, there was this urgency to talk about um, a, a range of uh, experiences of, of, of persecution, uh, to talk about my uncle being interred in asylum-seeking detention centres, um, basically being placed in prisons, which is what they are. You, you're, you're in a place where you know, it's against your will simply because you travelled from one part of the world to another. Um, and then on the other hand, David talking a bit about his uh, grandfather's experience of being sent by the British to Kenya to teach agricultural methods and uh, essentially try to create a, a middle class that would respond to the, uh, the British. In the end, that was uh, unsuccessful due to the, uh, the, the uh, Mau Mau uh, re rebellion and uprise. There's a couple of other images here um, that detail the, uh, the trilogy. I think another thing that I should add about this as well, and again, this... This highlights the whole uh, collaborative aspect of, of the way that we work. There is a, uh, a kind of side story component to the, uh, the Finding Fanon, Fanon uh, trilogy, um, which is called Finding Fanon Gaiden. And we take that from a bit of the, uh, the, the approach to uh, creating video works with the, uh, the Finding Fanon 2 project, which for some of you, if you are gamers, you'll notice uh, this has been ripped right out from uh, the Grand Theft Auto uh, 5 video game. So David and I, we kind of, we, um, we, we exploited the, uh, the, the video uh, filming aspect to the game and uh, by using a cheat or two here or there and, and a little bit of hacking, we were able to uh, create avatars of ourselves where we're run wandering across uh, these empty environments where there are no people whatsoever. Um, we realized after doing that, we wanted to kind of try and open up the other conversation with the, the Finding Fanon project. You know, we built up these tools. I, I was essentially creating the, uh, the, the soundtracks for the Finding Fanon project. I was composing using my uh, analog synthesizers and beat machines and so on. Um, and, and together we were creating or working with these visuals from a very kind of popular uh, video game. And we were writing scripts together, or sometimes apart actually, because David's based in Brighton. I'm based in East London. 
to get from his place to mine, uh, from door to door, you're looking at two to three hours. So, you know, it's not possible to be around each other all the time. We also have family as well. So um, we, we tended to like text each other on, on, on WhatsApp, which is what we use a lot. But we, we basically wrote this script and brought that together in the end. The point I'm trying to make is we had these three elements of script writing, uh, music or audio production, and uh, uh, video production that we felt we could bring to, uh, to, to work with other you know, communities and so on. And so one of the, uh, the, the first projects within the, uh, the Gaiden um, uh, work was, with, was made with um, veterans who are within the, uh, the criminal justice system, veterans who are, within, are in prison. We did that with uh, FACT, uh, which is not too, too far from here. And um, it, was really, it was really humbling to be able to work with um, families who, who had stories to tell that don't tend to be represented in the, the, uh, the media, to talk about uh, their traumas or some of their struggles, um, to then work across to, to, to another you know, country where we work with uh, paperless migrants in, in Oslo, uh, Norway. Um, to, to then again listen to experiences of, of, of certain turmoils with, with, with traveling, um, undocumented and so on. Uh, then to work with a female refugee group in, in Nottingham with uh, the New Art Exchange um, gallery space. So uh, for us, the, the, this project is really, is not simply just about you know, two men talking about you know, their different experiences on, you know, with India, the colonial coin, but to really try and open up a space or allow uh, that agency of, of, of other people's stories that have been silenced to kind of come out. Anyway, I just want to play for you about a couple of minutes of the, uh, the Finding Fanon 2 film, and then we'll move on from there. So that work is, uh, is online along with uh, part one. I'm just going to move ahead just because I know that we, we don't have too much time. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll probably finish off with, with this work, uh, Sunday's Best, which is uh, shown uh, recently with uh, Heart of Glass. Um, Sunday's Best as a, as a project kind of happened, um, it wouldn't have existed uh, had David and I not collaborated together. Uh, I say that 
in, in a sense that when we were writing the, the scripts for the Finding Fanon uh, project, particularly between uh, Finding Fanon 1 and 2, uh, that there were a lot of ideas that we, we, we brought to the table that just ended up being cut, cut out. I wanted to talk a lot about um, my experience of being taken to uh, Ghanaian churches as a kid and, um, and that connection with uh, Christian imperialism. But it just, it didn't fit. And so that was kind of pushed to the side. But then for me, thinking about my solo uh, practice, I thought, well, there's a space for me to do that. And so out of that, I began to develop the, uh, the Sunday's best work. Um, so I, again, like I said, I wanted to, I wanted to write this story that um, came from the viewpoint of maybe a six or seven year old version of me. Um, thinking a lot about the, uh, the environments that, that I would be taken to uh, as a kid every Sunday. And when I talk about these uh, Ghanaian churches, they're not uh, like really elaborate in, in, in the sense where you have you know, this type of architecture within um, the, the, the Catholic church that you have uh, uh, in front of you, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. Um, but they're really uh, spaces you know, at the bottom of like council flats or estates. They were within uh, community centers. There were no kind of, you know, objects to adorn or to kneel or to pray to, to genuflect, etc. cetera. Um, and it was really centered around uh, the, the, the community and people. Um, but the reason why I wanted to think about this experience of going to this type of church is that later on in my childhood, I was taken to a local church uh, not far from where I lived in Bethnal Green called Our Lady of the Assumption, a Catholic church. I don't really understand how, on the one hand, I was taken to these, um, these Ghanaian community churches uh, f full of uh, migrants who, you know, kind of stuck together as family. And then all of a sudden I was taken to uh, what I called white church, because there's mostly just white people there, um, where prayer was a very different thing. It was, it was, it was much more slow. It was, a bit more, it was a bit more quiet. You know, you weren't kind of singing with the whole of your chest. Um, and there were these objects, these, these objects of, of, of what apparently was Christ or Mary or, you know, apostles and so on. Um, so I went, I went about this, this process of uh, talking to the, uh, the, the local church, having already uh, built up a relationship from knowing them in, in, in previous years. I said to them, I wanted to film within this space. Um, and also I knew that I wanted to um, I wanted to work with my mother, who you can see in, in the, uh, the, the far right and the, the middle image. I wanted to invite her to uh, evangelize within the church. So she came to uh, Our Lady of the Assumption one day in the summer um, and we, we did some filming. I, the only thing that I asked that she do is just she stays right in the, uh, the, the, the middle um, kind of furthest point away from the, uh, the seats right at the, uh, the, the, the back distance so that I could film her. I could film her from various angles, but she was invited to evangelize or do whatever she wanted. So in a way, I was going, I was going to the church to do some filming, to, to make a video work, and she was going to church to pray, and I was trying to capture that. Um, so we did that kind of successfully, say kind of, because when I look back at the, uh, the rushes, um, I wasn't really happy with, with what I, I'd got back. I, I filmed the work in um, 1080p uh, HD. You know what that is, 1080p, yeah? And um, I thought this doesn't look like the church that I, that I kind of went to when I was really young. Uh, and I'd, I'd known that some 4K cameras were, were beginning to get a bit cheaper and you know, more available for, for people to kind of you know, buy at a certain cost price. And, um, and so I did something which I, I, I don't really do with my projects. I kind of disbanded all of that visual material and said, OK, well, I'm going to save up for two 4K cameras. So I got a couple of uh, Panasonic GH4 cameras. Um, you're still following me in terms of the fidelity stuff, by the way. I'm sure the younger people are doing so more than the older people. But 4K is four times the size of regular HD. Yeah? So there's regular HD, and then 4K is um, so you get a much more, you're getting a crisper image, you're getting crisper visuals potentially, depending on the camera that you're using, colored a lot. Um, but I had to wait 
a whole year for the um, for the light to kind of come back again. You know, the, the light's not as intense or strong coming through uh, the, the stained glass windows and so on. So I had to wait that year, but that was kind of convenient for me because I could use that time to save up for these, these cameras as well. In the meantime, I was also working with a, uh, a church group within uh, South London. I, I collaborated with South London Gallery. They invited me to work with uh, a local community. And I said I wanted to work with um, any, any type of small uh, church community, uh, m more likely a, like a Methodist or evangelist kind of Baptist type uh, church. So one that, that may have been similar in line with uh, the, the church that I went to, but they didn't necessarily have to be Ghanaian. They didn't have to be culturally. Uh, however, they happened to find a, a Ghanaian uh, church uh, called the, uh, the, the Christ, oof, uh, Christ Apostles Church. I've almost forgotten the name, but you'll find it in the, the credits in the video that I play uh, later on. And um, for me, the idea was not to, not to record visuals from the, uh, the ceremony. I wasn't, I, I felt that might kind of fetishize the, uh, the experience of, of, of their mass, but I was really interested in sound, the way that sound kind of reverberates, the way that, um, uh, that, that, the spirit kind of gels itself with sound or the way that they think about the other spirit. Um, and that, in the end, kind of became part of the other work as well. So again, you know, to kind of finish off, as much as, you know, me talking about work as a kind of solo artist um, is, you know, spoken of as solo, you know, there are always, there, there are always other uh, people who I'm working with or I'm talking to that kind of help me to realize these ideas. Um, and, and I say that with, with, with a bit of pride, really. I think working on one's own, there's only so far that you can get. Think about it on a basic level. Um, you know, your resources as one person, you have a certain amount. If there are two people, you have twice the amount of resources, right? Um, you, you therefore have twice the, uh, the, the, the brain capacity. And so, you know, the other person next to you might be thinking about things in a way that you hadn't dreamed of, you know, um, or the background that they come from might give you a, a, a totally different outlook. And for that, for me, is, is a really important thing. I wouldn't, uh, and, and it's another thing about the, uh, the art scene that I'll kind of, you know, pr pr prime you guys for, should those of you kind of go to that point is, I think, you know, there are, there are parts of the art scene where people are really guilty of uh, trying to create um, products out of people as individuals, you know, as individual enigma that thought of everything themselves. And I don't know, I just don't, I don't think that the world really works that way. I think a lot of ideas uh, come into fruition as a result of people connecting with each other. So, um, you know, you guys are in the perfect context for that because there are loads of you and you can, you know, talk to each other with the projects and things that you're doing. Um, and, and I do say that openly. I think it's important uh, to, to, to collaborate with people because you learn about ideas from totally different perspectives. Otherwise, you're, you're making things from a very, um, a very individualized point of view. Any questions? I'd say I don't subscribe to religion personally, um, but you know, this work wouldn't have been possible without me respecting uh, another space to, to practice that, you know. Um, you know, the conversations with my mum is, is, is nothing but uh, respect and honour. And so the, the, the idea was not to, um, you know, create something that uh, tries to insult people, but really I think kind of creates a, a, a critical conversation and one around a certain point within history. Uh, how that relates to, to, to the, uh, the present. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, my children, my, my, my kids, they go to, you know, Catholic school, you know, along with like other kids, some people who, who are not of the, uh, the Catholic faith, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It's interesting because I have a man saying I'm sort of atheist, but mm. Catholic. Mm. I suppose that my children's Catholic school. Mm. Uh, some of that is what I'm just thinking, yeah, no, certainly. I think um, I think what this film kind of uh, shows, without without you know saying directly, is is 
as somebody who was, you know, brought up with um, kind of a Christian approach to like praying and so on, whatever that is, because there's so many strands of it, right? Uh, I, I, I began to kind of nitpick at things and, and, and through that began to learn a bit about my own um, Ashanti heritage the, uh, and, and, and some of the practices that we have in terms of like praying and, and you know, uh, deities that belong to us, like, you know, Nyame, for example, which is, is mentioned in, in, in the work. Um, but that word Nyame is, is used by a lot of Ghanaians, Christian Ghanaians, when they're referring to um, the Christian God. You know, for me, I'm, I'm trying to reach that point of what that original faith for the Ashanti or Kem people were. Um, yet, due to this kind of uh, breakdown of communication as a result of colonization, as a result of slavery, you have like words or languages and things like that jumbled up or fused and so on. So um, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to say that I, I'm thinking a lot more about some of those uh, traditional or indigenous practices uh, than, than that of the, uh, the Christian uh, kind of counterpart. Could I ask something? Um, yeah. Do you think that the running theme throughout all of the work that you've shown us is, and this is a suggestion, so mm. these are the kind of things that went through mm -hmm. my head, um, do you think it's a, that the, all of the work is about trying to take something back that's been taken? I was thinking in terms of things like identity, how the identity is, has been distorted or suppressed. You talked quite a lot about people mm. who had stories that were not normally... Mm -hmm. Uh, heard, or even people who are not normally seen in mm -hmm. situations like, you know, the invigilators in galleries or whatever. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, do you think, is that a conscious attempt to try and take something back? Or is it, do you think of it more as an exploration that you, to, to explore the, those identities? It's probably a bit of both, in a way. Um, yeah, there's, there's a subconscious kind of element to that. Um, there's a project that I was going to talk about, but, I, you know, we don't have time for, but... Um, which is, is an ongoing project I'm, I'm working on, uh, which is titled Relic Traveller. It's set at a point in the future, it's a speculative project that kind of asks the question of, well, with the increase of nationalism uh, throughout you know, various parts of the, uh, the Western world, and, um, and then at the same time, you have this passport program that the African Union have been working on, and it's been kind of uh, introduced since 2016, which will allow uh, people to travel uh, amongst the, uh, the African states without any kind of like problem visa wise and so on. You have this part of the world where borders are closing, another part of the world where borders are opening. In my eyes, this idea that I thought of is that, um, you know, where you have borders closing, where you, you're cutting off uh, the connection to cultures, you're cut, cutting off, it's not simply just about um, labor or resources, but you're also cutting yourself off from culture. And, and, and from that, you become a relic over time. You know, so this project, Relic Traveller, is, um, is set at this point in time where the, the African Union is a, a place of, uh, of, of prosperity, of uh, harmony, of independence, of the various programs. They create the, uh, the Relic Travellers Alliance, and Relic Travellers essentially travel outside of the African Union uh, to places um, where people have been oppressed, and it could be any type of people who are oppressed. It's not simply people of colour or black people. Um, but what you kind of get, particularly from the films, because it's a multifaceted, pro uh, multifaceted project, with the, uh, the films, you hear the, the testimonies of these people who, who may have been forgotten. And the idea is that the, uh, the African Union uh, learns from a kind of um, a bottom-up perspective rather than a top-down one, learns from the experiences of people. Um, yeah, I think to answer your question, I am interested in, in, in power structures. I'm interested in, in who gets to say what and how and when. Um, through my collaborations, by working uh, and, and consciously trying to work more with um, women practitioners, uh, uh, queer practitioners, I am interested in, in, in people who historically get pushed to the periphery. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's, it's, it's not... It's not my job to, to, to change that alone, but you know, it's something that I feel, uh, I feel passionate about. Um, 
and yeah, so I think that there, there, there is, yeah, I think you're right. There's certainly this, this ongoing search, as it were. Um, but I think in terms of culture, it's not simply just for me thinking about my own uh, Ashanti heritage. You know, I'm, I'm a massive like video gamer. I'm really into my video games. Got my Nintendo Switch in that bag there. I played that on the way here. I didn't do any work. True story. Um, you know, so, you know, that comes into the work as well. You know, I throw elements of, of uh, you know, contemporary video gaming, old school video gaming in, in, into the work as well. So, you know, for me, that becomes part of the identity, the identity of being a gamer, of being a cosplayer, of taking my son to Comic-Con and things like that. So, um, yeah. I thought, um, sorry, just to, to just carry on. Please. Sorry. I thought it was really interesting the point that you made about the Robinson's Marmalade and that it was a commercial decision mm. and it's not a... A, a moral or a social decision, um, and that kind of, given what you just said about identity, that I, I wonder, and I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger thing for all of us. Mm. The questions of identity will come down to capital if we're not careful, <coughs> rather than social decisions about who who has who has an identity, who is allowed an identity, mm. whose culture is allowed to come forward, mm. or is who even allowed to express that culture. And that, that's a that's quite fr that's a very frightening thought, you know, the climate that we're moving into. No, most certainly, I agree. I was going to ask you earlier about the area of people that are being marginalised. It goes back to Korea, it's generally faith here, but do you think class is possibly a stronger driver? No, of course. I mean, you know, like I said earlier on, I'm, I'm from working class background and I think the thing that's peculiar, that's been peculiar for me in terms of doing what I've done since leaving um, university education this year marks uh, 10 years since I did my MA is as I climbed the uh, I climbed the academic ladder. There were there were fewer people who were of like working class background and fewer people of color. Um, and that was really weird for me because in Bethnal Green, where I grew up at the time anyway, because Bethnal Green now is it's cafes and whatnot, but like in Bethnal Green and then um, uh, Dagenham, Essex, where I, where I grew up, uh, is a very you know, working class environment. Um, and then learning about contemporary art, going to gallery spaces and stuff, you know, there are hardly any people from <laughs> those kinds of backgrounds, even white working class people especially, right? And that for me was just, absolutely. So yeah, no, absolutely, definitely. I think, I think class is a big deal for me with my work. It's, um, it, 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 the, the nuances come out in, in, in various ways. The, uh, the, the collaboration with David, the, uh, the, the Finding Fanon project, we talk about class, we talk about the different uh, positions that we occupy, me being black and working class, him being white and middle class, and those, those, those differences. But then that, that, conf that conflict of the fact that, you know, although we've known each other for like five years, um, we, we played some of the same video games at different points of our own childhood. So it's like we've known each other the last 20 years, but we kind of haven't. Absolutely. Um, I think there's, I think the, I mean, appropriation now is, you know, everything, nothing is sacred. You know, um, the way that I use the other family photo albums is, you know, you could think about the way in social media, how, you know, your, your, your breakfast is no longer your breakfast, it's everyone else's breakfast. You know, everything is kind of, is free for all. Um, uh, and, and, and with that, sometimes the value of, of, of that thing that is personal kind of, you know, fades away or drops. Um, but no, that's, for me, it's, that, that's a continue, continuing like, investigation. I'm not sure if I'll come up with a particular answer to that, but I'm more interested, I guess, in asking the, uh, the questions around that. And yeah, certainly I'm interested in the questions around appropriation, but particularly when thinking about power structures, uh, who gets to say these things and when? Because in the art scene, you know, people can, they can bring in like a grime MC or somebody uh, who, who's from Yorkshire or something who, who, who sings is from a working class background and then they'll use that for themselves and they'll say, this is the thing, but before that it's low culture. So that, for, that, that's, that's what I'm interested in kind of highlighting, I guess. I don't, I don't know what I'm appropriating <laughs> in terms of middle or, or upper class. Um, no, that's a good question, but I don't know what it is that I'm appropriating in terms of middle or upper class culture. 
Appropriating? I don't know. It's not. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. It's a good question, but I don't know if appropriation is the right word for that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course, I'm interested in occupying these spaces. I'm interested in uh, taking that, that, that power and opening that up, opening that up in spaces like this, for example. You know, that, that makes people uh, from backgrounds that tend to be marginalised feel that, you know what, I can actually do that. I can actually go there and do that something. So um, I would say appropriation is the word within that particular context, but certainly this, uh, this uh, position of, 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 of occupying spaces and using them, yeah, definitely. That's, yeah. I think for me, the thing about Fanon is the thing about the language, how he said um, oppression was built into language already, whether it's a, uh, a racial oppression or a working class oppression. So actually, it becomes part of the air that you breathe, you go up with it, and never sort of, well, maybe makes one question, really. And it's always that sort of feeling of not being good enough. It's already there, really. Absolutely. You're very impressed from the very beginning. Yeah. And it takes a while for you to actually realise that it doesn't have to be like that. Mm. That's difficult because it's so integral to your personality and identity. Yeah. And that's the problem, I think. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a parent of, of, of two, I have, a, I have an eight year old and a, and a four year old. And the way that, you know, things are kind of drawn up in front of them in terms of like school, like, this is what's right, that's what's wrong. This is for girls, this is for boys, this is this color that, you know, um, and, and, and the, list, the list goes on, you, which kind of informs the way that they should, they should think or feel, the way that certain beauty, what beauty standards are, etc. Um, is, 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 uh, is something that I'm kind of relearning in a way. It's like I'm revisiting these periods. Precisely. The working class are all like, oh yeah, guess what? You know, and then the, the higher classes, they are speaking with these types of accents. And yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. And that's how it works, isn't it? You're already subdued, you're already kept down from a very early stage, and it takes a long time for you to actually maybe never get out of it, because you never see it. Well, you become a kind of participant in the oppression of the Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I kind of, I, 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 take, I take pride out of having grown up in the places that, that I did where, where I know where I know the street language, where, you know, it is a skill for me. You know, in certain places you go, someone's talking to you, you talk the wrong way, they see you as an outsider, you know. Um, very much also like my mum, like, I guess, you know, she, she knows how to switch on the, uh, the Queen's English when she's trying to get someone to fix something or whatnot, you know, and then when her her friends call up, then it's, you know, it's back to Ghana, it's back to Ashtown. I think, for me, the word is skill. There's a skill in being able to use, you know, certain languages, but yeah, I agree. I think um, there's certainly a hierarchy that's set with, with uh, certain, you know, colloquialisms, but I, I personally don't see it that way. I, I, I see it definitely as a skill, because for me, it's the difference of being able to communicate with certain people and connect with them and not. You know, I've done projects with, with young people from, um, actually, I, I didn't even say, but, you know, what kind of added to working on the Ed Fanon project. I worked with um, uh, young men uh, who were in prison in, in, in Belmarsh, southeast London, and they, were, they, they grew up within the same context as me. So we're all, you know, like using, like, the street language and so on, just a way to kind of connect and talk. I think if I didn't have that, it would have taken much longer or it would have been a bit more difficult to be able to connect or to talk with them, you know. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's a skill.
again, it's another big question, really. Um, that you know, you'd, yeah, yeah. There we go. Star Wars, uh, not Star Wars, Star Trek, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, like I said, it's it's that's a tough one because I think I mean, there's a time and a place for, for for various things. I don't think that violence is is the key or the answer, but um, but self-defense is important. Someone's being beaten or hurt, like. I'd rather that that person be able to defend themselves than to just call out and, you know, simply ask for people to help. Most of the time nowadays, people are using their cameras to film people you know, rushing in to try and help someone. So I think it, that kind of thing, it depends. Um, yeah, I talk, I talk to my, my, my kids, particularly my, my eldest, quite a lot about, about violence, about defending themselves within, you know, atmospheres uh, uh, where, where they, they have been bullied. You know, I take them, I, I actually do um, karate with them on a, on a weekly basis. That's important because they need to understand about their body. They need to understand about the responsibility, not uh, just to their selves in terms of their body, but the person who is trying to hurt them, you know, which can happen. And I, I, I don't think, you know, it's me, me and David, we actually throw that back and forth, you know, the, the, the question of violence because Fanon talks a lot about this in terms of uh, rebellion or revolution. Um, and, and, and I'm not a fan of, of, of violence, but if, uh, if someone's trying to hurt you, I just don't think sometimes that books are really going to help you. <laughs> They're just not. Like, you know, you say, to, oh, well, look, look at all the... Con no, the person is going to coming to get you. They're coming to, like, do damage to you. They're not coming to, like, listen to some kind of semantic response or whatnot. You know, so, and, and then, of course, if we think about that in relation to, uh, you know, um, violence against women or queer people, uh, what am I going to say to them? Oh, well, guess what? You know, you should probably, you know, <laughs> I don't know, pull out a, 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 a verse from Socrates or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It, it just, I think, um, yeah, we, 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 we live in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in complex times with that as well, but... Uh, I think there's a time, unfortunately, in some ways, there's a time and a place for everything. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, I. You know that that was some that wasn't even something I even kind of set out to do or plan really. Um, but I'll probably I'll quickly show you. But um, on the uh, the Relic Traveler project, I I've been working with my son over the last. I mean, actually, my son is in Sunday's Best on on the far left, but. I've been working with him over the, uh, over the last few years even. You know, it's like this continuing, kind of like continuous journey of conversations. The character, the, the, the Relic Traveller character was actually written, uh, written for him and written for my, my daughter. I couldn't get my daughter to be a Relic Traveller because she was like free at the time, and very unruly, and she's not going to stand there when I'm filming. She wants to kick daddy or whatever. Um, but uh, it's, it's been fun to have, I think, like a cross-generational conversation. With that, for me, I'm also learning. Even as somebody who plays video games, I'm learning a lot about the way in which kids just love their tablets and they don't like uh, certain console games anymore. And I'm like, no, you got to love your Nintendo or your PlayStation. All right, fine. If you like your Android, go for it. Um, but it's, yeah, for me, that, that's a learning experience as well. So I think with these projects, every time I'm kind of working on on these, these different situations, it, it becomes a, uh, a place for me to learn and, and to learn about, uh, about human stories, really. So, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a great um, opportunity to have to, to connect across um, generations. Thank you.
Oh, definitely. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, with some of the um, with some of the earlier work, that that was only I was only able to connect with certain people. Or when I when I kind of spoke about my interest in vinyl with um, with young groups, they were like, "Well, what's that? We use MP3s." You know, so some of the projects I would kind of open up by uh, talking about sampling in a much wider sense because I have to understand that I'm part of the last generation that would use, you know, analog media. You know, I, I was literally, I, I was part of that generation that was at the edge of using, uh, you know, analog film before it kind of moved into that digital, you know, space. So um, I think about ways that I can re you know, re-invite that and to think about the differences of, of sampling by, I don't know, just taking a mini jack and then sticking it into uh, a laptop or an iPod versus, you know, feeling a, a record physically, you know, because there's something different about that, you know, or like even the, the relationship of just opening that, that, uh, that gatefold and looking at the inlay, looking at the artwork. There's just a whole different relationship that you're, you know, you're having with the, uh, the material rather than simply, oh yeah, I'll just listen to, ah, oh, it's a wicked beat. That's, you know, which yeah, has its place, of course, the, that's, the music is what connects us, but um, I'm interested in all of those different um, layers of, of information. When, when, could I ask you, when you used the kind uh, of the auto space, what was your decision? Because obviously that comes with a whole load of back itself, and, it, and it, um, when I clocked those three images, I clocked, I think it was made of, there was like a, um, almost like a town square sort of shot, mm. and it was from that, and I thought, I think that, that was like a, that was like a mm. daughter. But there's two questions really. One is, did you choose it? Was, was that baggage part of the reason you chose it? And two, if it wasn't, does it bother you that, because I, when you played the film, and I was trying to listen to the voice, but at the same time my brain was going, wow, that, that is those, you know, those, those Grand Theft Auto vistas are amazing. You know, yeah. they, they, you know, this, it's quite a few years ago now, and they still look yeah. terrific. You know? the, yeah. Does that bother you? Does it, does, because obviously that, that that's part of the cultural mm -hmm. interaction that anybody looking at that would Most have. certainly. So why did you choose it and two, does it bother you? Very good question. So when David and I were, um, when we knew we wanted to produce Finding Fun on 2, we, we looked at different video game engines that we wanted to exploit. So we thought about uh, Fallout. For us, that was kind of too far into the future and also one that was a bit, uh, shall we say, um, de depressive of, you know, this kind of the fallout of nuclear war and so on. Um, we thought about um, the, the Skyrim franchise, but that felt a bit too Nordic, it felt a bit too white. Um, and I think with Grand Theft Auto, what you have, and that, I don't think David's played it as much, he has played from the first one, but probably not as much as me, is... Um, this, this multitude of melting pots of, of, of culture, albeit it's created from the perspective of, you know, uh, or originally from the perspective of white guys from, you know, middle class backgrounds in the UK. So they're thinking about gang culture within, um, I don't know, like LA, Los Santos and so on. And, um, and that already therefore felt like an interesting kind of place to, to, to occupy or to even question, to think about the relationship of violence within that game, and then to add that complexity of, of, of uh, conversation around violence that uh, Fanon talks about. Um, so no, visually, I think we're, we are interested in people kind of falling into that, 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 that space, because yeah, it's true, visually, you know, these are cra they're crazy vistas. There's just, they're, 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 they're a, miles and miles of, um, of, of virtualized space in that game that actually don't get used. You know, you have missions, you go to specific places. Of course, there's loads of missions. You don't get to go to everything. So we really, we, we, were, we were very much, we were interested in some of those critical conversations, but I think from a visual point of view, we wanted to kind of just you know, pull away all the stuff like with the guns and whatnot, you know, because that becomes a reference already in a way, right? So what are you left with when, you just, when you're just the individual or two sets of individuals that are just walking around? And it's this crazy 
you know, almost limitless envir environment. Of course, there are invisible walls eventually, but it's just stupid massive. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Cheers.